Okay, this is 9.5 interference of light waves. And if you were in class today, we actually did this in class, so you don't need to watch the lesson, but I'm making the video as well. So we're picking up from 9.4. In 9.4, we were talking about this debate over particle versus wave, and in the 1600s and 1700s, there was no real decision one way or the other. It seemed like people liked Newton's idea of particles, part light as a particle. And so this, there was a continued debate in the 1600s to 1700s. And the big thing was people didn't buy, they didn't buy the wave theory, the wave theory, because no interference was detected. That was the big selling point of the wave theory of light, was that they were saying, well, waves interact in this way, they, um, they create interference patterns, interference and diffraction, and um, the problem was there wasn't any real good evidence that this was actually happening with light. And so they said, well, problem solved. I guess it's not a wave because there's no interference. And that's not mean, that doesn't mean they weren't trying to find it. A lot of people were trying to find interference in light. They were trying to create interference patterns. But they were running into lots of problems. And those problems included, they didn't know that these were the problems, but the problems that why they couldn't get any light interference was because the lambda of light is very small. which means that you need small slits if you're doing an interference experiment. You need small slits and large distances. And they didn't know that the wavelength of light was so small. They didn't know that that was causing them problems. So they weren't finding much interference with their experiments. That was one of the reasons. And the other reason was that they would often use two different sources of lights and try to find interference patterns between the two different lights. And the problem is then those two lights aren't in phase, and there's all sorts of problems that make it so that they don't have similar patterns of waves. And you won't find any interference patterns in that case. So the other problem here was, and the lights were out of phase. Those were the two big problems. So along came a guy named Young, and in the late 1700s, he used a single light source, and two narrow slits, And finally, he found diffraction with light. And this was a huge deal because it finally, definitively proved that light could behave as a wave. So finally, there was no question the wave theory of light was correct. Now, it turns out that the particle theory wasn't wrong either. They're both kind of true. But this is the first time that we can say for sure wave theory has to be true because particles cannot diffract. They cannot behave this way. So we got diffraction, and the experiment looked something like this, this picture down here. So he has light going through these two slits. Um, each one causes a diffraction pattern. Those diffraction patterns interfere with each other, and they create the interference pattern that you see on the screen there. We have another picture here, which shows the sort of diffraction pattern that you get, or the interference pattern, sorry, where you can see you have light bands and dark bands. And this, pic this uh, picture B here is with full white light. And this last picture here is showing the result with just red light. And this is nice because you can see it's just a single wavelength of light. You have very nice, clear, thick bands of light with small, dark bands of destructive interference. Okay, so what can we do with this? 
um, we have this experiment, and the result lets us actually measure the wavelength of light, which is really exciting. This was the first time with Young, this is the first time that anybody was able to actually measure the wavelength of light. Remember before this, they didn't even know for sure that light had a wavelength, that light was a wave. So, with those light bands, we have maxima. And these are the light fringes. that come from constructive interference and just like with our other um, interference patterns we can name these fringes so these are called the zero order maximum for the center one zero order maximum That's the bright center band. First order, second order, etc. You get the idea. So again, we name these from the center out, where the very center bright light band is called the zero order maximum. And we have an equation then for where these are located. And that equation is d sine theta equals m lambda, where m can equal 0, 1, 2, 3, like that. And this is a big deal, because now we have an equation where we can directly find the wavelength using these light bands. d, d here um, is the distance, you can see in the picture below, d is this distance between the two slits. So d, distance between the slits. So we have d sine theta. Theta is the angle to the, um, the band. Is equal to m lambda. So if we're looking at the zeroth band or the first band or the second band, we can measure the angle measure the distance between the slits, and it's going to let us find the wavelength of light. That's actually a huge result, and it really, um, really did some amazing things. Let us measure the wavelength of light. Okay, similarly we have minima, and these are the dark lines in between the light ones, and these are of course from destructive interference. And we have an equation for that as well. It's this very similar equation. d sine theta is equal to n minus one-half times lambda. And here n starts at one. And that's because there is no center dark band. At the very center, there's a light band. So if we're counting our dark bands, it's going to start at one, the first one away from the, the center. So there we go. This is a very, very useful set of equations um, that we can use to, to solve the wavelength of light. On the next page here, we have just a little bit of an extension of those two equations. So those equations said, if we have our um, two slits here, they're separated by some distance d. This is the distance d here. And there's a screen over here with some interference pattern. We get light bands like this, a light band, a light band. So this is going to be light band 0, this is light band 1. You can see in between we would have a dark band there. And what it was saying is that the angle theta here um, can be used to measure our wavelength. So if you have d this is from the previous page here, d sine theta is equal to m lambda. In this case, you can see that our m is 1, if we're looking at this first light band. We have our angle theta, the distance d, and um, we could solve for lambda using that. 
what we have on this next page here is an equation. Instead of using the angle, now we can find the distance between these light bands. So again, we still have d, the distance between our two slits. And that's how our light is moving. We have our screen over here. We have our light band 0, light band 1. And if I want to measure the distance here, I could call this x1. That's the distance to the first light band. And if I know the distance here, L, from the slits to the screen, I can find x1. That's what the equations are that we're looking at right now. So distance from the center to a maximum. This is xm is equal to m times L lambda over d. That's our equation. And so you can see then, if we want to get x1, we would do 1 times L times lambda over d. And we can use that uh, distance to, to find, again, the wavelength. Cool. And if you wanted to find delta x, which is the distance between our, um, our light bands, well, this is just equal to L lambda over d. You can see that sort of comes out of xm. Okay, and now just a slightly different one for the um, from the center to a minimum. Remember our, our minimums, these are these dark bands in between. So instead of m, we have n minus 1 half times, again, L lambda over d. It's the same story for delta x, L lambda over d. It's the same spacing for these dark bands as it is for the light bands. Okay. Now we have a whole bunch of equations. Now we can solve our problems. The first one says a double slit experiment is carried out with slit spacing of d 0.41 millimeters. The screen is at a distance of 1.5 meters. The bright fringes at the center of the screen are separated by a distance of delta x, 1.5 millimeters. Calculate the wavelength of the light. OK, well, we have an equation here. Delta x, well, before I do the, the equation, I'm going to draw, draw a picture of what's happening. So we have our two slits here. Those are our two slits. We're told that d, this distance here, d equals 0 0.41 millimeters. Remember, we're going to have to convert that into meters before we can um, solve our problem. OK, so that's our distance. And then over here, we've got a line, and here's our screen. OK, we're told that we have a light band at the center. And we're told that the spacing between our light bands. So if I've got a light band here and a light band here, you know, just the distance between two light bands is delta x. We're told that that distance is equal to 1.5 millimeters. And we're told that the distance L here from the slits to the screen is 1.5 meters. And that's all we know, and that's fine, because we have an equation. For our light bands, delta x is equal to L lambda over d. I can rearrange that to find the wavelength. Lambda is equal to delta x times d over L. So we get delta x. Delta x was 1.5 millimeters, so 0 0.0015 meters. My d is 0 0.41 millimeters, so 0 0.00041 meters. All divided by L, the length, 1.5 meters. This is going to give us a value of 4.1 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. Good. That's our wavelength of light. That's, that's all there is there. So we'll go on to the next problem here. This says the third order dark fringe of 660 nanometer light is observed at an angle of 20 degrees when the light falls on two narrow slits. Determine the slit distance. So again, I'll draw our situation here. We have a slit distance. 
this guy d equals um, well question mark we're trying to find the slit distance we have our light going this way onto the screen it's creating an interference pattern here we have a light band a light band a light band and we're told that we're talking about the third order dark fringe so here's the first order dark fringe second order dark fringe I need to make one more light band up here to get our third order dark fringe in between those okay so there's our, our third order I'll just write that a bit better our third order dark fringe so I can draw an angle here it says that my angle here is 20 degrees the last thing it tells us is that lambda the wavelength is 660 nanometers and now again we're gonna have to convert that into meters and you are responsible for knowing how to convert micrometers nanometers these sorts of things to meters that won't be on a formula sheet you need to know those things so a nanometer is 10 to the negative 9 meters All right. We've got our situation here, it's all laid out. We can use our formula from the previous page. I'll just show you that again. We're talking about our dark lines, our minima, so we have d sine theta equals n minus one half lambda. I can use that here. So d sine theta equals n minus one half times lambda. This is for our dark uh, dark lines. All right, we just need to rearrange to solve for D. And now we can plug in some numbers. We have N is 3, it's our third order. Lambda was 660 six, times 10 to the negative 9 meters over sine of 20 degrees and that is going to give me 4.8 times 10 to the negative 6 meters and just to make sure that we remember all of our unit conversions our metric conversions 4.8 times 10 to the 6 that is equal to 4.8 micrometers of course either of these answers is acceptable I was just reminding you how how these units work all right and that is the end um, there's a few homework problems there I hope you enjoy them and I'll see you in the next lesson